Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Pride de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. I said we would look at changes in the McCann's initial story. Now I'll move on to look at just one of the many contradictions in the McCann's account of events. Again, it concerns the first day, the 3rd of May 2007, and it's a hugely significant contradiction because it concerns the last time that Madeline was seen alive by anyone other than the McCann's. The McCann's story is that they put the children to bed between about 7pm and 8pm that night. Then, the children all asleep, as they claim, they cracked open a beer and some wine before wandering down to the tapas restaurant at about 8.30pm to dine with their friends. The rest of the evening's events were set down by one of the McCann's friends, Russell O'Brien, on a timeline. Soon afterwards he produced a second one, slightly different. Bizarrely, these timelines were written up on the ripped-off back page of a Sainsbury's activity sticker book belonging to Madeline, which the McCann's had handed to Russell O'Brien. It seems incomprehensible that they should treat their precious daughter's sticker book so lightly. But what we are going to do now is examine an event that is said to have taken place just before the McCanns put the children to bed. One of their closest friends, Dr. David Payne, claims to have seen Madeline and the other two children during the half hour before then, 6.30pm to 7pm. This event, if it happened, is hugely significant. For the McCanns, it would prove that Madeline was alive during this half-hour period. The McCanns admit that they were the last people to see Madeline alive. But if there was any doubt about Madeline being alive that early evening, then a clear statement by their doctor friend that she was alive between 6.30pm and 7pm would undoubtedly help them. And indeed, right on cue, just after the McCanns were made suspects, David James Smith in the Times on the 9th of September wrote, on the evening of May the 3rd, the last moment when Madeline was definitely seen alive by anybody other than the McCanns was about 7pm as the group put their children to bed. That reference was to the McCanns' long-term close friend, Dr David Payne. A significant article appeared in mainstream media on the 22nd of September 2007. The Daily Mail ran a major article, McCanns, What Really Happened in Madeline's Missing Six Hours?, by their correspondents Sam Greenhill and Paul Harris, based in Pride de Luz, and Dan Newling. Leaks had emerged from the Portuguese police that there were major gaps in the McCann's accounts of what happened during the afternoon and early evening of the 3rd of May, the day Madeline was reported missing. The print media ran stories about the missing six hours. The Mail claimed it was the first full account of Kate and Jerry McCann's final day with their daughter, a poignant chronology of a summer day that turned to tragedy and grief. That claim was not true. It was neither a full account nor an accurate account. For a start, this so-called full account completely omitted any reference to Dr. Payne's alleged visit to the McCann's apartment said to have taken place between 5.50pm and 6pm that evening. The Mail's account said, The McCann's played tennis in the afternoon while Madeline went back to the creche. Madeline had high tea at 5.30pm with staff at the kids' club. She was picked up shortly before 6pm by Kate and Jerry. After that, Kate and Jerry went home, got the kids ready for bed and got ready to go out for their meal. That account is significant. It does not mention any visit by David Payne to the McCann's apartment. It does not say anything about Jerry McCann playing tennis at 6.30pm, as claimed elsewhere. The Mail article gives the impression that the McCann family went home at 6, put the kids to bed, got ready to go out and then went out to dinner, which they say was about 8.30pm. If we also bring in the evidence of Fiona Payne, David Payne's wife, even more contradictions come to light. 
She maintains that she went to the McCann's apartment at 7pm and that her husband, Dr David Payne, joined her there 10 minutes later. There's no mention of this elsewhere. And besides that, Dr Payne is adamant in his statements that his wife was not at the apartment and moreover that he was playing tennis after 7pm until 8pm. Another TAPA 7 member, Dr Matthew Oldfield, likewise says that he, Russell O'Brien and David Payne were all playing tennis from 6pm to 7pm, completely undermining Dr Payne's statement about his alleged visit to Kate. Even more bewildering, he says that at that time, Jerry, Kate and all three children were at the tennis court, with Kate and the three children watching Jerry. This contradicts the McCann's claim that all of them walked back to their flat 20 minutes earlier. So let's begin our analysis of this claimed event with Dr. Payne's actual statements. He was first interviewed by the Portuguese police at 11.45 a.m. on Friday the 4th of May, the day after Madeline was reported missing. This is all he says on that occasion. Concerning yesterday evening, he states that he, his wife and his mother-in-law arrived at the restaurant at around 8.55 p.m. According to what he remembers, when they arrived, all the members of the group were present apart from the children who were in bed. During the evening, Jerry, Jane and Matthew went alternately to their children's bedrooms to check if they were sleeping. He thinks they physically went to the apartments. He no longer remembers in what order they went to see their children. So nothing whatsoever about seeing Madeline alive between 6.30pm and 7pm. It appears that David Payne may subsequently have made at least one, if not two or more, written statements to the police and been interviewed by Leicestershire Police. None of these statements are anywhere to be found in the documents released in 2008 by the Portuguese police. The following crucial email was sent on the 24th of October 2007 by Detective Constable Mike Marshall of Leicestershire Police to Ricardo Paiva of the Portuguese Police. It reads, Ricardo, as requested, appended are the statements of Arul and Catharina Gaspar. I read carefully the written statements by David Payne, but was not able to extract any other information besides what is already known. He declares that he saw Madeline for the last time at 1700 hours on the 3rd of the 5th or 7th in the McCann's apartment. Also present were Kate and Jerry. He did not indicate the motive for being there or what he was doing. Similarly, he does not indicate for how long he stayed. When asked with whom he was on the afternoon of the 3rd of May, he declares that this information was already offered to the police and he cannot remember if anyone else was there. He does not remember what he was wearing that afternoon. So some very interesting statements here, from one police force to another. We'll see the significance of them as we probe this alleged visit further. Payne has told the police, 1. He saw Madeline at around 5pm. 2. Both Kate and Jerry were present when he saw Madeline. He completely changed that in later statements when he said it was at 6.30 and that Jerry was not there. In a very plain statement, DC Marshall also tells us that Payne didn't know why he had gone there, he had no idea what he was doing there and he has no idea how long he stayed. Nearly a year after Madeline's disappearance, however, Dr Payne was again interviewed by Leicestershire Police. They carried out what is known as a rogatory interview. It was carried out by British police officers following what are called rogatory letters sent to the Home Office asking the British police to interrogate witnesses. Detective Constable Messiah carried out the interview at Leicestershire Police Headquarters, Enderby, on the 11th of April 2008. It began at 10.26am. It begins with him describing meeting up with some of his friends for what he describes as an evening meal at the Paraiso restaurant. We know from a CCTV recording that this occurred around 5.30pm to 6pm. Here is the relevant passage of his statement. It's taken directly from the police transcript of this interview. Uh, I was down uh, windsurfing. I must have been windsurfing for a couple of hours. Uh, saw Matt and Russ out on uh, the catamaran. And after we finished there, we, you know, we met on the beach. Uh, played with the girls on the beach. And then we went to the uh, restaurant which is on the uh, overlooking the beach and you know we had uh, the evening meal there. Uh, after we had the meal we got some ice cream and then uh, we decided that we were going to go up and play tennis. So I left uh, with uh, Russell, we left the, uh, the girls at the restaurant and we went up to the, uh, back up to the Ocean Club. Uh, as I say I'm not sure you know what happened to Matt and Russell at that particular moment. 
But I remember then, you know, I went over to see uh, Jerry at the, uh, you know, tennis courts just to see, you know, what was happening and uh, decided that we'd, you know, I'd come back to play tennis and uh, Jerry had asked me just to pop in and check everything was all right uh, with Kate or, you know, again, I can't remember the exact reason whether he was just making sure it was all right that he could stay there and, you know, more time, but, you know, he'd asked me to pop in. So I walked back uh, from the tennis courts uh, back to, uh, you know, Kate and Jerry's apartment and the time, you know, looking at, you know, we've looked obviously at photographs since then and, you know, the time that we've got that I was, you know, going to Kate's about 6.30 uh, and I went into their apartment through the patio doors. The three children were all, you know, dressed, you know, in their pyjamas. You know, they looked immaculate. You know, they were just like angels. They all looked so happy and well looked after and content. And I said to Kate, it's a bit early for the, you know, for the three of them to go to bed. She said, ah, they've had such a great time. They're just, they're really tired and, you know, uh, so to say, you know, I can't remember exactly what, you know, the night attire, what the children were wearing, but white was the predominant uh, colour. But, you know, just to reinforce, they were just so happy seeing, you know, obviously Jerry wasn't there, but they were just all just so at peace. And, you know, they looked like a family who'd had such a fantastic time. And, uh, yeah, then I left there went and got my stuff, went back to the tennis courts, and then uh, there was me, Matt, Russell, and I think Jerry played for a little while, but he decided that he'd, he'd played enough tennis for that day and uh, was going back, and so it left with me, Russell, and uh, Matt, and uh, Dan, who was the you know tennis coach for Mark Warner. The statement is extremely hesitant. It does not flow as it would if someone was telling the truth. He gives every appearance of thinking very hard about every statement before he makes it. Whilst many of us routinely use erms and ers as we speak, sometimes to give us a short space for thinking, this short passage is remarkable for including 30 ers and 27 you knows. We also have a number of statements of doubt, I think, not sure, and can't remember. But let's look at the main things he says. These are, 1. He meets Jerry McCann at the tennis courts. 2. Jerry McCann asks him to see Kate. He can't actually remember why. 3. It was about 6.30pm. 4. He walked through the patio doors. 5. The three children were all in their pyjamas ready for bed. They were mostly white in colour. 6. Kate and the children all looked very happy. 7. He went back to the tennis courts. 8. He played with Jerry for a short while and then Jerry stopped playing as he'd played enough tennis that day. The police officer then probes him about how he met Jerry at the tennis courts and about Jerry asking him to see Kate. Payne now becomes even more hesitant. And what was Jerry doing? Uh, Jerry had been, you know, playing, you know, tennis already. He was having a good uh, game and I think there was, you know, and there were a couple of the other tennis players who had specifically gone there on the Mark Warner holiday to play tennis and, you know, Jerry was, you know, getting a lot out of the week from the tennis and made friends with those people and he was having a good time with them. Uh, so, you know, he would basically be playing tennis. Yeah, and at what point did you have the conversation with him? Did he stop the game, or did you speak to him whilst he was playing? I can't remember. I can't remember. I, you know, in my mind, you know, he stopped playing, and, you know, but I can't remember, if I'm perfectly honest. And how long did you stay and watch the game for? Uh, all I remember is I was having a, you know, a brief conversation with Jerry, uh, you know, and then, you know, I went back. I didn't actually stay there for too long because of the time, you know, it was ticking by. Uh, but again, these are, you know... As we can see, he cannot remember exactly how this supposed conversation with Jerry McCann actually occurred, nor does he say who was actually playing tennis with Jerry at this time. The police officer presses him about the moment when Jerry is supposed to have asked Payne to go and see Kate. OK, and it was at what point that Jerry said to you, go, and would you mind checking on Kate? Well, I mean, coming back from the beach, I'd got no equipment to play tennis, you know, etc. So I had to go back to my room to, you know, change into my stuff appropriate for playing tennis in. And uh, so he knew I'd walk up that by and past. So he said, oh, why don't you, uh, you know, you can just pop in on the way. So it was on the way back from me picking the stuff up. Right, so you've walked past, you've walked past Jerry's apartment to get to yours, mm. got changed. In my mind it was on the way up that I'd popped into Kate, but it could have been on the way back again, I'm sorry. No, it's okay, for my vagueness. But either way you'd have to walk past because you go the roadside, don't you? Yeah, 
so you'd have to walk past Jerry's. Yeah. Front door twice, wouldn't you? Yeah. Is that right? So the reason why I think it was more likely that I did it on the way there was because I've called in through the uh, patio. It kind of made more sense that I'd have walked in through the gate and then up through the, you know, where the sliding doors are to say I'm here rather than going to my apartment, coming back down, coming past the apartment and then coming in the sliding doors. Yeah. Because what I would have done is I'd have got changed and gone downstairs and then knocked on the front door because that, you know, that would have made more sense rather than going all the way around and, yeah, of course. So that's in my mind why it makes more sense that that was on the way up. Analyzing this, he is extraordinarily vague about the sequence of events, but he ends up saying that after speaking to Jerry, he went up the flight of steps to the McCann's apartment, then walked through the open patio doors to see Kate and the children, then left, walked on past the front door of the McCann's apartment, got changed into his tennis gear, then walked back past the McCann's front door again and back to the tennis court, where Jerry was still playing. Then there is a passage where the police officer asks Payne to remember precisely what happened when he went to the McCann's apartment. This is how the interview goes. I just want to revisit the going and seeing Kate before we move on. All right, the reason why I've kept it separate is because I want you to just think now. Mm -hmm. And imagine, remember what you saw. Mm -hmm. Did you open the door, sliding door, or was it already open? Or, uh, I think it was already open. Uh, you know, as I say, I walked up there. Kate was, you know, I say, looking very relaxed. And uh, I say a comment to her. And I said, well, crikey, it's early. Early for them to be getting ready, you know, for bed. As I say, she said, ah, no, I've had such a good, you know, such a good day and afternoon. Uh, so, you know, and Jerry's just obviously finishing off playing tennis. And uh, so, you know, hopefully try and get them down and as I say we were just you know I know it does sound bizarre but I just looked at the three of them and I couldn't you know they were just so well presented and so clean and immaculate it was you know I was and you know they just looked such healthy children uh, you know there's you know nothing that normally yeah triggers in my mind like that but it was just how well that they looked and uh, try to remember where they were in the apartment the time that I was there uh, you know all all of them, uh, all the children and Kate were in the, uh, as soon as you go through the patio doors, uh, you know, they were all in the immediate area, you know, in front of you. Uh, that was the area that they generally, you know, when I saw them, no, I didn't go any further into the apartment. You know, it was just a conversation that I like, you know, walked into the, you know, through the French doors. I went into the lounge, uh, you know, the open plan area and, uh, you know, just had a brief conversation. You know, things started off by, as I say, saying about the, how well they looked and you know it's early to get them ready for bed and then I said oh Jerry's you know just finished over there we're going over to play a bit of tennis uh, I probably said is there any problems with that and she said uh, no no fine you know carry on and uh, you know perhaps a bit more of conversation uh, but it wasn't many minutes that I was there yeah but uh, certainly enough time just to see you know certainly the apartment there was nothing that was untoward that was, you know, uh, the children all looked extremely happy and there was no, you know, signs of any problems with, uh, you know, Kate, you know, or indeed the relationship that Kate had got with any of the three children. None of the children had been told off. None of the children looked like, you know, they were in trouble for anything. You know, they were uh, still all talking and playing around. Uh, so, you know, it was just a very uh, transient, you know, that I'd gone in there. But as I say, it just struck me how well they all looked. Yeah. And content, I suppose, is the other word to use. Did you actually go into the apartment? I did. Or did you do the conversation from the door? No, definitely was inside the apartment. You know, whether it be two or three steps into the apartment or, you know, however many. I was definitely in the apartment. Okay, so now what I'm going to ask you to try and recollect what everybody was wearing. I'm afraid that is, you know, I'm, I cannot recall at all. You'd think that would be an obvious thing to remember. I cannot remember. From the children's point of view, predominantly, I can remember the, you know, white, but I couldn't say exactly what they were wearing. Uh, but could you remember what Kate was wearing, for example? I can't, know. And did you actually set eyes on each individual child? All three children I saw, yeah. And were they standing up, sitting down? Uh, they were generally standing up, yeah. Did they actually acknowledge you? Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I'm very sure that if you'd have asked them, you know, that evening or the next day, They'd all say, uh, yeah, I popped in. You know, I, you know, I did know the children very well. 
we'd all, you know, met up many times before. Uh, you know, I, you know, again, I'd be playing with Madeline, you know, in the uh, in the play area, uh, you know, during that week, you know, lifting her up, twizzing her around, and everything. I knew her that well, you know, to do that. And as I say, uh, she definitely knew who I was. And certainly, as I say, just to reinforce, she looked very happy. Yeah, was that the last time you saw Madeline? It was. How many minutes? You said as a matter of minutes, and then you went back, and then you played tennis. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pin you down and ask you how long you think you were in there for. I know you say minutes. In the apartment, it's, it, I'd say three minutes, five maximum. Three to five. Yeah. So then you step back out. Did you leave the doors open, or did you close them? Uh, I couldn't remember... You know, again, I've got the in my mind that the patio doors were open when I went in, and I probably would have just walked out back that way. You know, it's still, I mean, it's still relatively nice outside. It was light and everything, so, uh, you know, I, whether they kept the door open, it's just nice when it's in the end of the evening, you know, sorry, you know, the end of the afternoon. But if I'm perfectly honest, the answer to that question is, I can't remember. Okay, so when you went back and then you played, you played a game for about an hour. Once again, he gives extraordinarily long, rambling answers to the simplest of questions, such as, where were the children in the apartment, and did they acknowledge you? Again, there are excessive errs, 35, and a remarkable 56 you-knows in that short section of the interview, plus many as I says and I means. To a number of questions, he answers, I can't remember, or I can't recall. But we're now going to compare Payne's account of this alleged event with what Kate said on the record about it. Just to remind ourselves, Payne has made these factual issues pretty clear. He entered via the patio door. It was probably open. He went into the apartment. He saw Kate and the three children. He stayed for three to five minutes. So what is Kate's version of this encounter? When interviewed on the 4th of May, the day after Madeline's reported disappearance, she says this about the time between 5pm and 8.30pm. Around 5 to 5.30 p.m., the children ate at a bar under the watchful eyes of the parents. After the 5 p.m. dinner, they bathed the children, prepared them for the night, and let them play for a while at a playground next to the tennis courts, still and always under parental supervision. At around 8 p.m., the children were put to bed until the following morning, when the described routine started all over again. So at this stage, there is no mention at all of the supposed visit of David Payne to her apartment, but Jerry does refer to it in a statement he made to the Portuguese police on the 10th of May. During the afternoon of that day, the rest of the group, including the children, were at the beach, having returned at 18.30 hours, the time at which he saw David Payne next to the tennis court. David went to visit Kate and the children and returned close to 7 o'clock, trying to convince the deponent to continue to play tennis, which he refused, as he had already been playing for about an hour and had to go back to his wife. Nevertheless, Russell, David and Matthew stayed to play. He doesn't explain why David Payne went to visit Kate. He says David Payne left the tennis court at 6.30pm and returned a full half an hour later. Kate doesn't make another statement to the Portuguese police until the 6th of September. Here is what she said on that occasion. While the children were eating and looking at some books, Kate had a shower which lasted around five minutes. After showering at around 6.30 to 6.40, and while she was getting dry, she heard somebody knocking at the balcony door. She wrapped herself in a towel and went to see who was at the balcony door. This door was closed but not locked, as Jerry had left through this door. She saw that it was David Payne because he called out and had opened the door slightly. David's visit was to help her to take the children to the recreation area. When David returned from the beach, he was with Jerry at the tennis courts, and it was Jerry who asked him to help Kate with taking the children to the recreation area, which had been arranged but did not take place. David was at the apartment for around 30 seconds. He didn't even actually enter the flat. He remained at the balcony door. According to her, he then left for the tennis courts where Jerry was. The time was around 6.30 to 6.40 p.m. After David left, Kate dressed and sat with the children, Madeline on her lap. So let's look at the contradictions between the two accounts. Payne says he walked through the patio door which was open. Kate says that the door was closed, but Payne had opened it slightly. Payne says that he walked in without knocking. Kate says she heard someone knocking at the patio door. Payne says that Kate was dressed. Kate says she had just come out of the shower and only had a towel around her. Payne says he entered the apartment. Kate says he did not. 
and that he remained at the balcony door. Payne says he was in the apartment for three to five minutes. Kate says he was not in the apartment but at the apartment and only for 30 seconds. Payne says he saw all three children. Kate doesn't mention this. That's six significant differences altogether. Add to that David Payne's obvious hesitancy and evasiveness and his apparent difficulty in answering a straight question and remembering. Then put into the mix the fact that when questioned on the 4th of May, neither Payne nor Kate McCann mention this alleged visit. A suspicion clearly arises that this visit may never have happened and could have been fabricated in an attempt to prove that Madeline was alive at 6.30pm that day. But quite apart from the doubts we have already examined, there is one other aspect of this alleged event that we need to analyse, and that's the stated reasons by all concerned about why David Payne is supposed to have visited Kate and the children. Let's begin with the statement that Jerry McCann gave to the police when he was made a suspect. Regarding the episode where he spoke to David on the 3rd of May, he says that he was playing tennis at 18.30, when David appeared near the tennis court and asked him through the fence if he was going to continue playing. The deponent said he didn't know because Kate might be needing help to look after the three children, even more so because they intended to bring them to the recreation area after their showers. He thinks that David offered to check if Kate needed help, which he did, and returned minutes later. Concerning his previous statement where he states that David returned half an hour later at around 7 o'clock, he says that he returned to the tennis courts after half an hour, as this time frame refers to the second time he returned to the tennis court after dressing up for the game. So, interpreting what is being said here by Jerry, the conversation must have gone very much like this. Payne, are you carrying on playing? Jerry, I'm not sure. Kate might be needing some help. We're going to bring the children down after their showers to watch. Payne, OK then, I'll go and check. Before going on to look at what others have said about this alleged conversation between Jerry and Payne, there's yet another contradiction we need to note. On the 10th of May, Jerry had told police quite clearly that Payne had been gone for half an hour, 6.30pm to 7pm. Now he changes his story. This time he tries to say that Payne came back twice. He says that Payne came back a second time, quote, after dressing up for the game. But as we saw above, that's emphatically not what Payne says. He quite clearly explained that he was going from the tennis court to get changed. He says he can't remember if he called on Kate on the way to getting changed or on the way back. He decided it was on the way there that he must have called on Kate. So this is Payne's account of events. He left the tennis court, called at Kate's, went to his apartment to change, and then returned to play tennis. In other words, he returned once, not twice as Jerry now claims. The two accounts can't be reconciled. Before we leave this topic, even more contradictions arise when we examine what reasons have been given for Payne visiting Kate. The issue of this alleged visit of Payne to Kate McCann first arose in September 2007, four months after Madeline's disappearance, when sections of the British press began referring to the missing six hours, a gap in the afternoon and early evening when it was unclear what the McCanns and their friends were doing. The McCann team responded quickly by making various statements about this alleged visit of Dr. David Payne. Neither Kate nor Jerry McCann mentioned the alleged Payne visit in their first statements on the 4th of May, but Jerry McCann did in his second police statement on the 10th of May. He simply said that David Payne went to visit Kate at 6.30pm, returned at 7pm to the tennis court and tried to convince Jerry to carry on playing tennis. Jerry says in his initial statement, I'd been playing for about an hour. I had to go back to my wife. So Jerry tells us nothing about the purpose of this visit, just that Payne went to visit Kate. Kate McCann was interviewed by the Portuguese police on the 6th of September. This was the interview just before the later one, where she was shown videos of the cadaver dogs alerting. At that interview, she exercised her right to remain silent. But on the 6th of September 2007, she answered questions, and this is what she told the Portuguese police. While the children were eating and looking at some books, I had a shower which lasted around five minutes. After showering at around 6.30 to 6.40 p.m., and while she was getting dry, she heard somebody knocking at the balcony door. She wrapped herself in a towel and went to see who was at the balcony door. 
This door was closed but not locked as Jerry had left through this door. She saw that it was David Payne because he called out and had opened the door slightly. David's visit was to help her to take the children to the recreation area. When David returned from the beach, he was with Jerry at the tennis courts. Jerry asked him to help me taking the children to the recreation area, which had been arranged. But this did not take place. David was at the apartment for around 30 seconds. He didn't actually enter the flat. He remained at the balcony door. He then left for the tennis courts. That's different from what Payne had told Leicestershire Police. He had said, I can't remember the exact reason, whether he was just making sure it was all right that he could stay there. In other words, according to Payne, Jerry is supposed to have asked him to go up to his flat and ask Kate, is it okay if Jerry stays down at the courts? The first report in the media about Dr. Payne's alleged visit to the McCann's apartment said this, it is reported that Mr. Payne was playing in a tennis competition, which included Jerry, on the early evening of the 3rd of May. It is alleged that when he had been eliminated from the competition, Jerry asked him to pop into their apartment and check on Kate. Reports state that Mr. Payne saw Madeline being put to bed by Kate at 6.30pm. If true, this would make David Payne the last independent witness to see Madeline before her disappearance. Here then, a third different reason is given for Dr. Payne's visit. This time it is to check on Kate, not to help take the children to the recreation area, nor to see if Kate would allow Jerry to carry on playing tennis. But now notice even more contradictions. It is claimed here that Jerry was eliminated from the competition. In his various statements to the police, he says nothing about a competition, certainly nothing about being eliminated from anything. On the 16th of December 2007, David James Smith wrote a pompous article about the McCann case, boasting of how he had got the inside story on what really happened to Madeline from Jerry McCann himself. He wrote, Jerry had knocked up at the start of the 4.30pm tennis drill session, but had decided not to exacerbate an injury to his Achilles tendon, so had dropped out and waited around by the courts. What do we believe? that at 4.30pm he was too injured to play tennis, or that at 6.30pm, two hours later, he was merrily playing away in a tennis competition. Quite probably, neither statement is true. Now let's look at another point about this particular statement in the mainstream media. Reports state that Dr. Payne saw Madeline being put to bed. Saw her being put to bed. Dr. Payne doesn't say that. Kate McCann doesn't say that. Yet there it is in black and white in the mainstream print media. Who put it there? Was it once again the man who claimed he once controlled what comes out in the media, Clarence Mitchell? In her statement to the Portuguese police on the 6th of September, Kate McCann had also said that Jerry and Kate both arrived back at the flat at 5.40pm. They both bathed the children because they were tired and needed to go to bed. Jerry went down to play tennis at 6pm. They decided the children were too tired to go down to the recreation area. So if that were true, then clearly any claims that Dr. Payne went up to the flat to see if Kate and the children were coming down were utter nonsense, false in fact. We saw earlier how on the 10th of May, Jerry McCann had referred to a visit by Dr. Payne to see Kate between 6.30pm and 7pm, apparently half an hour long. He had claimed in that statement that on returning from his wife, Payne had asked him to carry on playing tennis, but he had refused. But when interviewed by the police again on the 7th of September, Jerry McCann gave an altogether different reason for Payne's alleged visit. He now told police, I was playing tennis at 6.30pm when David appeared near the tennis court and asked me through the net if I was going to continue playing. I said I didn't know because Kate might be needing help to look after the three children even more so because we intended to bring them to the recreation area after their showers. He thinks that David offered to check if Kate needed help, which he did, and returned minutes later. He goes on to explain to the police why he first of all said that Payne was away seeing his wife for 30 minutes, but now was saying that the visit only lasted a few minutes. As we saw just now, he gets out of this by telling the police that David Payne returned twice, and the first time without his tennis gear, the second time with his tennis gear on. So if Dr. Payne really did visit Kate McCann around 6.30pm on the night Madeline disappeared, for which of the following reasons was it? 
All these have at various times been given by various witnesses. A. Just for a visit. B. To bring her and the children down to the recreation area. C. To check on Kate to see if she was all right. D. Kate might be needing help to look after the children. E. To see if it was okay for Jerry to carry on playing tennis. Or F. Because Dr. Payne offered to go. So let's now round up our review of this alleged visit of Dr. Payne and his claim of seeing all three children. We examined six key contradictions about the claimed visit. Let's call those contradictions one to six. We've seen another list of contradictions about the supposed reasons for the visit. Let's call those contradictions seven to twelve. But we've now seen a whole raft of other contradictions. Contradiction thirteen. When was the visit? Payne first of all said it was 5 p.m. Later that was changed to 6.30 p.m. His wife said he got there about 7.10 p.m. Contradiction 14. Was he there at all? Both Fiona Payne and Matthew Oldfield say he was on the tennis courts between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Contradiction 15. Statements were made to the media saying that Payne saw the children being put to bed. Neither Payne nor Kate McCann mentioned this. Contradiction 16. The McCanns say they took the children up to their apartment at 5.40pm and stayed there. Matthew Oldfield maintains they were all on the tennis court at 6pm, 20 minutes later. Contradiction 17. Jerry McCann maintains he was at the tennis courts at 6.30pm, when elsewhere reports say that he and his family were quietly putting the children to bed at that time. Contradiction 18. Payne first of all said that both Jerry and Kate were there when he visited the apartment, Later, he changed this to saying it was just Kate. Contradiction 19. Payne says he returned once to the tennis court. Jerry McCann says it was twice. Contradiction 20. Jerry McCann was too injured with an Achilles tendon injury at 4.30pm to carry on playing. An hour and a half later, he was apparently able to carry on playing in a competition. We have examined just one alleged incident in great detail and revealed 20 separate contradictions. That's because it's so important, the last time someone other than the McCanns is supposed to have seen them. The accounts of this alleged visit differ so comprehensively that I suspect most of you will probably agree with me that this visit didn't happen. And if so, what implications does that have for the rest of what the McCanns say about Madeline's disappearance? If we had the time, we could have exposed so many other changes of story and contradictions in depth. Here's a whole lot more that we could have gone into in the same way. Different accounts of whether both parents were with Madeline at tea time on the 3rd of May. Changes of story by Dr. Matthew Oldfield about what he did and what he saw on his alleged check on the children at 9.30pm on the 3rd of May. The McCann's friend Jane Tanner claiming she saw a man carrying a child away from near the McCann's apartment. Then later the McCann's spokesman saying she might have seen a woman. Jane Tanner saying she walked right past Jerry McCann and another holiday maker, Jez Wilkins, neither of them saw her. The puzzle of why a photograph of Madeline, said to have been taken by Kate McCann on the last day of their holiday, was not produced for three weeks. Conflicting statements by the McCanns about whether the twins slept in beds or cots the night they reported Madeline missing, whether the McCanns called their daughter Maddie or Madeline. There are dozens of them. At the end of the last film, I'll refer you to books, leaflets, websites, forums and blogs where you can get more information. Before leaving the subject of David Payne's alleged visit to Kate McCann at 6.30pm on the evening Madeline was reported missing, we need to mention another issue which once again the mainstream media have avoided despite the fact it is clearly part of the evidence in this case. This evidence comes from two respected general practitioners, Dr Catherine Gasper and her husband Dr Savio Gasper. They had previously been on holiday with the McCanns. As soon as the news of Madeline's apparent abduction became headline news on Friday the 4th of May, the Gaspers were concerned. Their thoughts turned to two unseemly incidents 
that had occurred whilst they were quaffing wine at their holiday villa alongside the McCanns and Dr. David Payne and his wife. Let's go straight to their witness evidence and see what they told Leicestershire Police on the 16th of May 2007, just 13 days after Madeleine McCann had been reported missing. My husband Savio and I are general practitioners. My husband knows Kate as they both attended Dundee University between 1987 and 1992. We got to be close friends of Jerry and Kate. In 2002 or 2003, Savio and I spent a weekend with Jerry and Kate in Devon. In September 2005, me and our first child, aged 18 months, holidayed in Mallorca with Kate, Jerry, Madeline and their twins, Sean and Emily, who were only a few months old. There were also other friends of Kate and Jerry there, including Dr David Payne and his wife. They had a daughter around one year old. Dr Payne organised the trip. Probably around the fourth or fifth day there was an incident that stuck in my mind. I have thought about this incident many times since then. One night when all the adults were sitting around on a patio outside the house where we were all staying, we had been eating and drinking berbers. I sat between Jerry McCann and David and I think both were talking about Madeline. I remember Dave saying to Jerry something about she, meaning Madeline, would do this. While he mentioned the word this, Dave was doing the action of sucking one of his fingers, pushing it in and out of his mouth, while with his other hand he was doing a circle around his nipple with a circular movement around his clothes. This was done in a provocative way. There seemed to be an explicit insinuation about what he was saying and doing. I remember being shocked by that. I always felt it was something very weird and that it was not something anyone would say or do. I looked at Jerry and also at Dave to gauge their reactions. I looked around as if saying, did someone else hear that or was it just me? The conversation stopped for a moment, then we all began conversing again. Moreover, I remember Dave doing the same thing on another occasion, again it was during a conversation in which he was talking about an imaginary scenario, although I'm not sure. He again stuck one of his fingers in and out of his mouth and with the other hand he once again drew a circle around his nipple in a provocative and sexual way. I think he was referring to the way she, his daughter Lily, would behave or what she would do. I remember thinking whether he would look at my daughter and other little girls in a different way than I or others do. I imagined that he had perhaps visited internet sites related to little children. In a word, I thought that he could be interested in child pornography on the web. During our holiday in Mallorca, each parent would bathe the children in turn. I was keen to stay near the bathroom if Dave was bathing the children, and told Savio to be careful and to be close by if Dave was helping to bathe the children, and my daughter in particular. During our stay in Mallorca, Dave and his wife Fiona and their daughter Lily used to take Madeline with them for the day in order that Kate and Jerry could rest a bit and have time just for the twins. The first time I heard the terrible news regarding Madeline on the radio, my thoughts raced immediately to Dave. I asked Savio if Dave was also on holiday with the McCanns in Portugal. He didn't know. I watched TV to catch the coverage and eventually discovered that Dave was there with the McCanns. As soon as she realised that Dr Payne had been in Portugal with the McCanns, she and her husband contacted Leicestershire Police. On the 16th of May they gave this important statement to Detective Constable Brewer of Leicestershire Police. And then we come on to one of the most extraordinary aspects of this case. This statement was suppressed by Leicestershire Police for five months. This vital piece of evidence was not sent to Portugal Police until mid-October. It was only sent to them a few days after the Portuguese police had removed Gonçalo Amaral from the investigation into Madeleine's disappearance. I'm sure I'm not alone in wondering why senior police officers in Leicestershire would suppress a report that contained the credible evidence from two respected doctors that someone who was with the McCanns in Portugal appeared to have an interest in child sexual abuse. It's time now for us to have a close look at what is arguably the main line of forensic evidence in this case and one that has caused a huge amount of controversy namely the evidence of two cadaver dogs brought to Portugal by one of the world's most sought after sniffer dog handlers British dog handler Martin Grime. In early August 2007 he brought his two dogs to Portugal 
One of them, Eddie, was trained to alert to the order of human corpses, and the other, Keeler, to blood. As we shall see in detail, Martin Grime told Portuguese police officers that Eddie had detected the scent of death in no fewer than 11 locations associated with the McCanns, while Keeler also detected the scent of blood in three of those very same locations. The dogs were deployed on different days, so they alerted to these locations independently of each other. What I first noticed is that as soon as I came in, um, the, the dog's uh, very excited, um, and as a handler I can pick up his um, body language, etc. And it would appear to me that as soon as he's come in the, in the house, um, he's picked up a scent that he recognises. there isn't a scent source in here, i.e. Um, a physical article where the scent is emitting from, any scent residue will um, collect in a particular place due to the air movement of the flat, of the, the apartment. Um, and what I would say in this case is that there's enough scent in that area there for him to give me um, a bark indication. Um, but the source may not be in that cupboard. The source may well be in this room somewhere else but the air is actually pushing it into that corner. Um, but it's, it's a strong indication um, and um, I, would, I would say it's positive for um, the things that he's trained to find. And he's decided yes that's what I'm looking for and that's when he's given me the bark indication. Um, what we should understand with this dog is that he only barks when he finds something. He won't bark at any other time. Um, the, the only uh, times I've ever known him bark since I, I got him as a small puppy was uh, A for his dinner um, and that's just excitement and, and that's one of the um, training methods we used to teach him to bark when we wanted him to and when he actually finds something. He won't bark at other dogs, he won't bark at strangers, he won't bark when somebody knocks on the door or, or anything like that. Um, so again I would say that's a positive indication. Okay, so. Let there be no doubt about what Martin Grimes said his dogs were alerted to. He said, in effect, that his dogs were alerting to the past presence of a human corpse in those 11 locations. As we shall see in a moment, no other corpses had been present in those 11 locations. Therefore, if a corpse really had been in contact with those 11 locations, it could only have been that of Madeleine McCann. But it's necessary also to point out that in his report, Martin Grime acknowledged that the evidence of his dogs alone was not sufficient to prove that a corpse had been in those locations. He said that there would need to be corroboration in the form, for example, of forensic evidence or the kind of circumstantial evidence we discussed earlier. He pointed out correctly that, quote, Whereas there may be no retrievable evidence for court purposes, these alerts may well assist intelligence gathering in major crime investigations. The dog's alerts alone then could not convict anyone of either killing Madeline or hiding her body. There would need to be other evidence. And a little bit later, we'll have a detailed look at how the McCanns themselves explained the alerts of Martin Grimes' two dogs. So first of all, who sent the dogs to Portugal? It was actually a combined operation by the Portuguese and British police. By July, two months into the investigations into Madeleine's disappearance, the team of detectives, led by Dr. Conchalo Amaral, had clearly formed the view that the McCanns and their friends were not telling the truth and were hiding something. They and top British police actively worked on the theory that Madeleine had in fact died in the McCanns' holiday apartment and that the McCanns, perhaps with the help of others, had hidden or disposed of her body. One top British police officer whose opinion was sought was Lee Rainbow who was then Britain's top criminal profiler, employed by the National Police Intelligence Service. He in turn consulted Mark Harrison, who recommended that Martin Grime and his dogs be brought in to search for evidence of past presence of a corpse and of blood in the holiday apartment rented by the McCanns, in the hired car they were using, and on their clothes, and on other personal items. And so Martin Grime was appointed. What were Martin Grimes' qualifications and experience for this task, which could determine the outcome of this whole investigation? 
By the time Graham was assigned to this task in July 2007, he claimed that in over 200 trials, Eddie had never been wrong. If he gave an alert in every single case, a corpse had been in that very location. Eddie's track record included some impressive results. Since 2007, Martin Grime has been involved in several more successful investigations. An outstanding example was a case in the USA. The cadaver dog evidence provided by Martin Grime's sniffer dog showed that a suspect had carried a body in his car. Martin Grime has taken his sniffer dogs to help in investigations in several countries and his expertise was so valued by the FBI that he has now set up a business in the United States, largely funded by his work for the FBI. His credentials are therefore impeccable. Only twice has his expertise been questioned, once in the McCann case, the other occasion was when he took his cadaver dogs to the notorious Haute de la Garand children's home in Jersey, where children were abused for decades, and there were credible reports that some children had been killed by their abusers. It was a place the late Sir Jimmy Savile visited more than once. Eddie alerted to the scent of a corpse in the Haute de la Garand home. He was videoed at the home. Bones were found, and one bone in particular was thought to have been that of a child's skull. When it was tested in forensic laboratories, it was shown to have been made up with 1.6% collagen, this proving it was a human or animal skull. Yet the establishment, aided by the mainstream media, circulated a baseless rumour that the laboratory had said the exhibit was nothing more than a coconut. Some excellent work in exposing the Jersey Home child abuse scandal has been carried out by Stuart Sivret of the Jersey Parliament, which shows how the false story of Eddie allegedly alerting to a coconut was concocted. It is a subject we may return to again in another documentary. So let us now consider exactly what Eddie and Keeler found when Martin Grime took his dogs to the village of Praia de Luz in the first week of August 2007. I'll do so by quoting from a document that the McCanns themselves are very fond of relying on, and that's the final report of the regional Portuguese Attorney General Fernando José Pinto Monteiro in July 2008. Things were moving rapidly in the summer of 2008, as this extract from Wikipedia tells us. A judgment from Evora Supreme Court of Justice in Portimao was released on the 29th of May and revealed that Portuguese prosecutors were examining several charges including a. abandonment of a child, b. abduction, c. homicide and d. concealment of a corpse. Two months later, on the 21st of July 2008, the Portuguese Attorney General announced that there was no evidence to link the McCanns or Robert Murat to the disappearance, that the case was closed and that the aguido or suspect status of all three had been lifted. On the 4th of August, the Ministerio Público, the Portuguese Ministry of Justice, released 11,233 pages of the case file to the media on CD-ROMs. This was the final report that recommended that the investigation into Madeleine's disappearance be shelved because there was insufficient evidence with which to charge any individual with being responsible for Madeleine's disappearance. The investigation was filed under the headings of crime, hiding a body or abduction, and the Portuguese police said they would only reinvestigate the matter if the Portuguese police received new and credible evidence that could lead to an arrest of the person or persons responsible. The release of 11,233 pages of witness statements, expert reports and evidential material to the public via a series of DVDs would never happen under British law. But in this unique case, it has provided the raw material for a legion of amateur sleuths in many countries to work on. So here's what Fernando José Pinto Monteiro's report told us. Under Section D of its report, headed Dog Searchers and the Constitution of Gerald McCann and Kate Healy as Arguidos, his report begins by noting that Mark Harrison, a national councillor from Britain for searches at the level of all police agencies in the United Kingdom concerning missing persons, abduction and homicide cases, had recommended that trained sniffer dogs be brought in which could, in his words, detect mortal victims by tracing very small samples of human remains, bodily fluids and blood in any environment or terrain. The findings of the dogs were recorded as follows. 1. Eddie signalled cadaver odour inside the couple's bedroom in apartment 5A in an area next to the wardrobe. 2. 
Eddie signalled cadaver order in the same apartment in an area near the living room window, which has direct access to the street behind the sofa. 3. Eddie signalled cadaver order at the same apartment in the garden area, in a square corner vertically below the balcony. 4. Eddie signalled cadaver order in the Vista de Mar Villa, that is, the house that was rented by the McCanns after leaving the Ocean Club, in the area of a wardrobe that contained inside it the soft toy cuddle cat that belonged to Madeleine McCann. 5. Eddie signalled cadaver order on two items of clothing belonging to Kate McCann, which were examined in a pavilion in Lagos. 6. Eddie signalled cadaver order on the door of the Renault Scenic, registration 59DA27, by the lower outside area next to the driver's door. 7. Eddie signalled cadaver order on the key card of that vehicle when it was hidden under a fire prevention sandbox. Strangely, the Attorney General's report actually left out some of the alerts, clearly mentioned by Martin Grime in his report. As for Keeler, the bloodhound dog, the Attorney General said this. 1. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled an area in the living room in apartment 5A, which had already been signalled by Eddie. 2. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled the same area again as where Eddie had signalled, in the living room of the apartment. 3. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled the lower part of the left-hand side curtain of the window in the same living room. 4. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled the right lower lateral part of the inside of the boot of vehicle 59DA27. 5. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled the storage compartment on the driver's door which held the vehicle's key card. 6. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, also signalled the car's key card when the same was hidden under the fire service sandbox inside the parking lot. The Attorney General added for good measure, The viewing of these videos, whose contents is very impressive, becomes essential to understand the dog's action and signalling more than by any words. We know from the book written by Portuguese detective Gonçalo Amaral that the report of Martin Grime on his dogs was dynamite. The Portuguese police had been doubtful of the McCann's version of events from day one. Their suspicions had led them to take advice from the British police. Top British police officers said it was reasonable to suspect that the parents had lied about what had happened to Madeline and may have covered up her death, whether it was accidental death or otherwise. Now they had what to them seemed concrete confirmation of their hypothesis. At around the same time, they had preliminary forensic results back from samples of blood and blood fluids found in the living room of the McCann's apartment and in the Renault Scenic that they hired. These first results showed that the samples matched the DNA from Madeline in 15 out of 19 indication, roughly, only a million to one chance that these samples were not from Madeline. The police had got powerful indications from the alerts of the two Springer Spaniels. The DNA results were heading in the same direction as we shall see in more detail in a later programme. Now, however, we will examine in detail how the McCanns reacted to the alerts of the cadaver dogs. It was perhaps inevitable that with the world's eyes on the investigation team in Portugal, and with the police now having the results from Martin Grimes' cadaver dogs, that at least one police officer would leak this dramatic news to the media. And so it came to pass. It was Monday the 6th of August, barely three months after Madeleine had been reported missing, that a Portuguese newspaper, Journal de Noticias, dramatically reported that British sniffer dogs had found traces of blood on a wall in the apartment where Madeleine went missing, below the window of the living room near the floor. The McCanns began to react two days later. A person described as a friend of the McCanns, Rachel Oldfield, one of the so-called Tapas Seven, was reported as saying she was disgusted at what appeared to be a deliberate smear campaign against them. She was quoted as saying, I think there are some leaks coming from the police because a lot of what I have read recently has been completely untrue. The following day the press referred to reports of an increasing backlash against the McCanns, both by Portuguese people and by fellow holidaymakers at the Ocean Club. The McCanns retorted that they would not be bullied and forced into leaving Portugal against their wishes. On Saturday that week, the Portuguese police acknowledged for the first time that Madeleine could be dead. Chief Inspector of Police Oligaro Sousa told the police that new evidence had intensified fears that Madeleine might be dead, but made a point of saying that the parents were not under suspicion. Less than a month later, that was to change dramatically. 
the McCanns reacted once again via a family friend by denouncing the police for not having the decency to inform us first about their new theory. Portuguese press reports suggested that the Madeleine McCann investigation had now entered a decisive phase. They were not wrong. Two days later, the McCanns did a round of interviews with Spain's three top-selling newspapers, claiming that there was a very real possibility that Madeleine was still alive. No doubt that took a little bit of organising by their media relations expert, Clarence Mitchell. The leaks continued, suggesting that evidence from the cadaver dog's alerts and DNA test results proved that Madeleine McCann must have died in the McCann's apartment. On the 24th of August, the McCanns were forced to react again, this time attacking preposterous speculation about Madeleine's fate. Jerry McCann says he is disappointed that so much information has been made public despite Portugal's strict judicial secrecy laws. A week later, on Friday the 31st of August, the McCanns announced they were going to sue a Portuguese newspaper, Tal and Qual, which reported correctly as it happens, that the police believed the McCanns were responsible for their daughter's death. Months later, the magazine folded. The McCanns never sued them. Events soon overtook them. Another week later, on Friday the 7th of September, the McCanns were taken in for questioning by the Portuguese police. They attended voluntarily. They were not arrested, but they were interviewed under police caution. So let's now go to Kate McCann's account of her interview by Portuguese police, where she is shown a lengthy video of the cadaver dog Eddie alerting to the scent of a corpse in the McCann's holiday apartment. On page 248 of her book, Kate McCann writes, Carlos, my solicitor, had advised me not to answer any questions put to me. He explained to me that this was my right as an arguida, suspect, and it was the safest option. Any responses I gave might unintentionally implicate me in some way. On page 249, if I'm honest, I'd been quite nervous about seeing the video of the dogs. I had no idea what to expect, although I was quite sure something couldn't be quite right about the results they had apparently produced. We knew from Bob Small, a Leicestershire police officer, that the responses of specialist dogs were intelligence, not evidence. But in my head, I'd built up these film clips into the most damning evidence imaginable. Now Ricardo was giving me his spiel about the dogs. These dogs have a 100% success rate, he said, waving an A4 document in front of me. 200 cases and they've never failed. We have gone to the best laboratory in the world using low copy DNA techniques. I just stared at him, unable to hide my contempt. What did he know about low copy DNA? These dogs had never been used in Portugal before. He knew little more about them than I did. Then Kate McCann describes the video she watched. The dogs went into our apartment, ran around the apartment, jumping over beds, into the wardrobe and generally having a good sniff. She then describes this significant moment. At one point the handler directed the dogs to a spot behind the couch in the sitting room close to the curtains. He called the dogs over to him to investigate this particular site. The dogs ultimately alerted. I felt myself starting to relax a little. This was not what I would call an exact science. At this point we can begin to see how Kate McCann is trying to minimise the impact of Martin Grimes' report. Here, in a spot between the curtains, behind the sofa below the window, Eddie, the cat of a dog, alerted most excitedly. His nose was certain. There had been a corpse there. Later, Keeler the bloodhound located body fluids at precisely the same spot. Contrary to the impression given by Kate McCann in the above passage, the dogs were not together on the same day. They went on different days so as to get two separate sets of indications from the two dogs. Kate McCann continues on page 250. To pour scorn on the dogs' alerts in the underground car park, where the McCann's car and nine others were parked, she noted that her car had posters of Madeline on it. And so the handler, Martin Grime, she says, would have noticed that. In one passage she writes... The handler stopped next to our Renault and called the dog. It obeyed, returning to him, but then ran off. Staying by the car, PC Grime instructed the dog to come back several times and directed it to certain parts of the vehicle before it eventually supplied an alert by barking. Did you notice that word eventually again? It implies that the dogs only alert anywhere after the dog handler has directed them to spot where he wants them to alert. 
Continuing down page 250, Kate McCann describes how the Portuguese detective, Ricardo Paiva, shows her video excerpts of the dog's alerts and then adds that in certain places blood had been found which matched Madeline's. Kate says, I said I couldn't explain it, but neither could he. She continues, I remember feeling such disdain for Ricardo at this point. What was he doing? I thought, just following orders. Under my breath I found myself whispering, Fucking tosser, fucking tosser. This quiet chant somehow kept me strong, kept me in control. This man did not deserve my respect, fucking tosser. So let's summarise before we move on to other topics. Kate McCann thinks one of the lead detectives on this case is a fucking tosser. Jerry McCann ignores the wealth of evidence that sniffer dogs are used reliably not only for blood and the scent of corpses, but also for drugs, explosives and even certain medical conditions. He pigeonholes them all as incredibly unreliable. And both of them maintain that the most respected and sought-after dog handler on the planet doesn't know what he is talking about, effectively accusing him of gross professional incompetence. Now we'll have a detailed look at how the McCanns dealt with this explosive evidence, yet another aspect of the case that mainstream media won't touch with a barge bowl. You can judge for yourselves how successful or otherwise they were. And we look at one US legal case the McCanns quoted in support of their claims that cadaver dog evidence was unreliable, the murder of Jeanette Zapatar. And so we come, finally, to how Kate McCann now explains all the dog's alerts, 11 by the cadaver dog and another 5 in the same locations by the blood dog. On page 250 of her book, when researching the validity of sniffer dog evidence, Jerry would discover that false alerts can be attributable to the conscious or unconscious signals of the handler. From what I saw of the dog's responses, this certainly seemed to be what was happening here. Let's be quite clear here. The McCanns are claiming that the dogs were plain wrong. They are saying that all 16 alerts by the two dogs were false alerts. They maintain that top sniffer dog handler Martin Grime didn't know what he was doing. It amounts to a libelous attack on Martin Grime, basically accusing him of gross professional incompetence. Now that was what the McCanns said about the dogs in a book first published in 2011, four years after Madeline went missing. But when the dog's alerts to a corpse and to blood were first reported to the press in August 2007, they reacted very differently. Let's examine what they said at the time. They came up with at least seven different excuses. The first was that any blood found in the flat, apparently found having oozed underneath the tiles in the living room behind the sofa, where the wall and the floor meet, might have come from Madeline's grazing her leg when she boarded the plane. It is very unlikely, however, that a graze on a knee at East Midlands Airport would produce significant blood hours later in Portugal. Any light bleeding from the graze would surely have stopped long before the plane touched down. The second excuse was that any blood might have come from a nosebleed. It was said that Madeline used to have frequent nosebleeds. Both of these explanations seem highly unlikely, given the amount of blood that would be needed for a small amount to seep through the tiles. In addition, it is hardly likely that blood from a graze on a knee or a nosebleed would be located at the edge of a room where the wall joins the floor. Nosebleeds usually leave only a few spots of blood, if any on flooring, usually being contained by a tissue or handkerchief or clothing. It's highly unlikely that Madeline would have sat still while copious quantities of blood poured from her nose or knee onto the tiled floor, right by the living room wall. One of the more entertaining reasons for blood spatters being found on the wall was given by Jerry McCann's sister, Philomena McCann, a teacher at Ullapool High School. She claimed that they could have come from mosquitoes crashing into the walls. Funny though that they only crashed into the area below the window in the sitting room and not anywhere else in the apartment. That became the third excuse. Now we move on to reasons given for the scent of a human corpse having been found in the McCann's hired car. The fourth excuse was that the dogs had alerted to the smell of the twins' dirty nappies being carried in the back of the Renault Scenic. 
That amounted to a suggestion that Martin Grimes' cadaver dogs could not distinguish between the smell of a toddler's feces and the scent of the past presence of a human corpse. The fifth excuse was that the dogs got confused with the scent of rotting meat. But these excuses failed to explain that as well as Eddie the cadaver dog alerting to the smell of death, Keeler the blood dog had also alerted to the presence of blood and other body fluids. An ingenious sixth reason was put forward, this time by Kate McCann's mother, Mrs. Susan Healy. She claimed that the smell of death may have been found on her clothes because Kate was said to have been in close proximity with no fewer than six corpses in her last two weeks at work. So far as this excuse is concerned, the claim that she visited any corpses during the last two weeks at work, never mind six, has never been confirmed. Further, those doctors who have to certify the cause of death do not always handle the body, nor handle it long enough or closely enough for the smell of death to be transferred to clothes. Further, this excuse only explained the smell of death on Kate's clothes. It didn't explain how the smell of death came to be found at four places in their holiday apartment, nor in their hired car. A seventh excuse was given to explain why the cat of a dog Eddie alerted to the scent of a corpse on the pink soft toy Cuddle Cat. Kate explained that she sometimes took Cuddle Cat to work. A newspaper report based on sources within the Portuguese police explained at the time Kate didn't contradict the fact that her two pieces of clothing and the stuffed animal Cuddle Cat had been signalled by the English dogs trained to find cadaver odour. She justified it by her profession. Kate McCann's mother alleged that as a doctor at the Leicester Health Centre, she was directly present at six deaths before she came to Portugal on holiday, giving the same excuse for Madeline's stuffed animal that was with her in the months after her daughter disappeared. Quite apart from being unlikely that a mother would take a child's favourite stuffed animal to work, never mind having it with her when she was close to corpses, it appears that experts say that it is not usually possible for the smell of death to be transferred in this way. Altogether then, within the space of weeks, the McCanns had given these seven bizarre excuses for the alerts of the cadaver and blood dogs. But these excuses were all very unconvincing. Let's now go straight to the witness statement by Jerry McCann, given by him when he was interviewed under caution by the Portuguese police on the 7th of September 2007, the day he was declared a suspect. It was a long interview, beginning at five past four and going on until ten to nine at night. During this interview, Jerry was also shown videos of the dog's alerts. Here is how the interviewing officer recorded Jerry's responses. After viewing the films, and after the signalling of cadaver order in their room, next to the wardrobe and behind the sofa against the window in the living room, he says that he has no comments, neither has he any explanation for this fact. The dog that detects human blood signalled human blood behind the sofa mentioned above. He says that he cannot explain this fact. Regarding the cadaver order in the car that was rented at the end of May, he says he cannot explain more than he already has. Regarding the presence of human blood in the boot of the same vehicle, he says he has no explanation for this fact. When confronted with the fact that Madeline's DNA was collected from behind the sofa and in the boot of the vehicle and analysed by a British laboratory, he says he cannot explain. When asked if on any occasion Madeline was injured, he says that he has no comments. In the aftermath of the shock of Kate and Jerry being made suspects, the McCanns and their ever-growing team of PR advisers and lawyers immediately began to pour scorn on the evidence of the cadaver dog and the bloodhound. They quickly cited, for example, an Irish court case where the judge would not accept the cadaver dog evidence alone because it was not corroborated. They claimed there were Irish and American lawyers who had been able to cast doubt on cadaver dog evidence, pointing to a US study which allegedly showed that cadaver dogs could be fallible. One case in particular was trumpeted by Jerry and promoted in the British press, that of the arrest of an American, Eugene Zapatar, for the murder of his wife, Jeanette Zapatar. Jeanette Zapatar was still missing, but a cadaver dog had alerted to the scent of a corpse in locations at their house and at a storage container associated with Eugene Zapatar's business. On the 17th of September 2007, just 10 days after the claimants had been pulled in for questioning by the Portuguese police, the Times published an article titled, Kate and Jerry McCann send to US for help against evidence of sniffer dogs. The article told us, the parents of Madeleine McCann have contacted the lawyers of a man charged with murder who successfully challenged sniffer dog evidence. His lawyers claimed it was unreliable and persuaded a judge in the US to throw out 
prosecution claims that the dogs had detected the smell of a corpse. Jerry and Kate McCann hoped that the case could help them to prove their own innocence. Portuguese police believe that the couple may have killed their child accidentally and then disposed of the body using a car they hired 25 days later. Although the McCanns do not know the full details of the Portuguese prosecutor's case against them, they are concerned that it may rest on the dog's reaction. Now their lawyers have requested the case files from the ongoing murder trial of Eugene Zapatar in Madison, Wisconsin. His estranged wife Janet, a 37-year-old flight instructor, vanished in October 1976 after taking her children to school. Her body has never been found. Detectives suspected that Mr. Zapatar killed her, but did not have enough evidence to go to court. Mr. Zapatar, 68, was charged with murder last year after sniffer dogs were brought in. They allegedly detected the scent of human remains in a basement at the former family home. But Dane County Judge Patrick Fiedler ruled that the evidence was inadmissible, saying that the dogs were unreliable. He quoted analysis of the three dogs' performance record, which showed that they were respectively incorrect 78%, 71%, and 62% of the time. The judge told the court, The state has failed to convince me that it's any more reliable than the flip of a coin. That is what the British press have told us about. But now comes the bit the British mainstream media have never told you about. Not long after the Times article, Eugene Zapatar confessed to killing his wife, and in making a full confession, he confirmed that the alerts of the sniffer dog used to search for where his wife's corpse may have been placed were wholly correct. In late 2007, a US newspaper reported, Zapatar enters guilty plea in connection with missing wife's death, the Eugene Zapatar case. During the past two decades, the ability of sniffer dogs to reliably detect an increasing number of substances has expanded greatly. Wikipedia, for example, tells us that sniffer dogs are used for all these purposes. Wikipedia adds that one notable quality of detection dogs is that they are able to discern individual scents even when the scents are combined or masked by other odours. We know from Martin Grimes that Eddie had never once been wrong in over 200 cases where he detected the smell of death or blood. Cadaver dog evidence has played a part in the conviction for murder of many criminals beside that of Eugene Zapatar. Here's a list of some of the cases where sniffer dogs have resulted in convictions or raised major doubts about claims by their parents that their children have been abducted or just disappeared. Finally, what are we to make of the attacks by the McCanns on the professional competence of the dog handler sent to Portugal, Martin Grime? The McCanns have publicly trashed his work on their daughter's disappearance, claiming that the dogs were doing no more than responding to his conscious or unconscious signals. This is the first time that you give us uh, a big interview, uh, not being a guido, not being a guido since then. Uh, so now I feel free to ask you this directly. Uh, how can you explain the coincidence of the scent of the cadaver, of cadaver felt by British and not Portuguese dogs? Sandra, maybe you should be asking the judiciary because they've examined all this. But don't you have an explanation for I mean, we're for that? Madeline's mum and dad and we're desperate for people to help us find Madeline, which is why we're here today. The majority of people are inherently good and I believe the majority of people in Portugal are inherently good people. And we're asking them if they'll help us spread this message to that person or people. So you don't have any explanation for that? Ask the dogs, Sandra. Ask the dogs, no, Jerry. Now I think that I, I feel free to ask you. Uh, don't you feel free to answer me? I can tell you that we've also looked at evidence about uh, cadaver dogs, and they're incredibly unreliable. Unreliable. Cadaver dogs, yes.